Are there any kind of specific asset classes or strategies, I guess, that you wish you'd paid more attention to earlier on in your team? Uh, yeah, so um, the, you know, that saying, and I've told, this is one of my dad's favourites, uh, was when he was driving down the street with one of his early mentors and he said, oh, I see that house there. I could have bought that five years ago for a fraction of the price. And I said, oh, Steve, right, in five years' time, you'll be saying the same thing about now. And um, and it's it's absolutely run true. But coming back to what you're saying about buying the right market, um, not necessarily asset class. It took us, took me and my family a long time to realise that um, buying interstate um opened up a lot more opportunities. Um, certainly there was more risks if I, if we were uninformed when we did it um, relative to buying where, you know, in our local area that we knew inside out. Um, but once we had a system for overcoming that risk and un- identifying the right properties, it opened up more growth potentials be- because that market could be going up while a different one, the one we were initially in was stagnant. Um, I... Um, wasn't as familiar with the Perth market um, as I should have been early on, like in the 2000s. Um, and it went through a couple of periods where, you know, it saw 100% growth in just a couple of years, um, which is crazy compared to the East Coast. Like the bigger cities tend to not have such sharp increases in price, but they're a bit more um, consistent and steady over time, whereas Perth can go up and stagnate for a while. But in those windows of time where it goes up, the equity you can create, the cash flow that those properties produce um, is awesome. So it took a long time to, I guess, realize the benefits of that diversification in different states. Um, Different asset classes, look, I've invested in just about every type of residential property. Um, I've owned commercial property, done development. Um, I continue to come back to to residential property and maybe that will change at a point in the future when um, I decide that my needs have changed, but obviously I'm growing wealth and I know no better asset class than residential property to safely and consistently grow equity, um, which opens the doors later on. And if, as a um, we've previously talked about exit strategies or transitioning to retirement and um, opens the doors to own different types of assets that perhaps have higher income but lower capital growth um, depending on what the needs are um, but uh, yeah the, the lessons I learned from the various different asset classes or different types of residential property investment whether that's block splitters duplexes um, development um, co-living uh, I could name a bunch more renovating um, the reward for effort diminishes um, there's certainly, you know, there's certainly some, some wins financially from some of those, but the stress, anxiety, effort, focus required to ensure success. I, over time, um, realized that again, a consistent approach to residential property with the low risk strategy, um, using the one, you know, the 10, to 21 percenters that you can do that don't actually require a lot of effort but just require a good plan um, produce far and above the the best return on effort and risk uh, of any investment I've made yeah yeah it's um uh, I've actually kind of forgotten about this until you talk but the uh, what is but um when we moved to a, a new area like around 2010 our pretty kids and we go on a weekend and it, it, it kind of felt like that, you know, every property was up for sale and these are, you know, 17 metre front of the box and you know, the standard stuff. Uh, and they're all being sold and, and you know, uh, Pink said, she was, you know, why, why are all these selling and why are they all passing in? And the very kind of back of the envelope, quick numbers in my head while we were walking, I'm like, well, based on what they want, plus the stamp duty, plus the bill cost, to do a split up, you're effectively taking one point six million dollars worth of risk for maybe eighty to hundred thousand dollars in upside if you get everything right. Mm-hmm. Um, and all that. that's not a great risk return, you know, trade off. Um, and so hence why they kind of were, yeah, um, the builders and the developers weren't as active with what they had been previously. 
opportunity to ask for returns just weren't there. And um, I haven't had the same breadth of experience across different asset classes that you have. That's why I thought it was a good question for you. But uh, the thing I come back to uh, is think about the way you drive to work every day or how you get to work every day. You, you don't take a different way just because it's a different day. You don't come up with a trip to that. You won't be able to get it and you just whether it's really, and that's really not working but it's super effective um and that's the best way you're in you know um it's not about being sexy it's about getting you know, if you're gonna get emotional about something get emotional about the result and uh then you know to follow follow the proof method yeah. i'd much rather use my spare time now uh enjoying a good lifestyle than trying to work out how to solve problems on on an investment um so yeah, it's and look to come back to your point in um, development, uh, particularly small scale development, um, and I'll exclude large scale development. It's a completely different ball game, and most people that's inaccessible almost unless you're a corporate these days. But um, for small scale development, while there was periods of time where the planning schemes were changing around Australia and development um, and backyard development and that sort of thing wasn't as well known there was absolutely a period where there was excess profits to be made. Um, what I've seen mostly in the last 10 to 15 years is really small scale developments. I'm talking buying a house, splitting it in two. Um, most of the benefit comes down to time um, that unless you know somebody and you've got an inside edge uh, or a, uh, advantage over the rest of the market, most of the profits have been made. Like you buy a block, you split it in two. Like you said, if you're doing 1.6 million of your, of risk and maybe they end up making 300 not a hundred thousand but the extra 200,000 comes down to the market because it took them two and a half years to three years to do the development um, it wasn't the value they've added from planning it was a value that the market added and if they just went and bought two eight hundred thousand dollar houses they would have probably made the same money with a hell of a lot less um, risk and focus and uncertainty <laughs> yeah um, so, uh, so yeah, that's kind of one of the things I, I often come back to when people tell me, I think I really want to be a developer and they're kind of starting from very low in terms of the knowledge base and relationships they need um, to be able to perhaps do a little bit better than the market. Um, and I try to run the numbers for them to show them side by side. And um, if there is so much extra profit in just from taking something from A to B and like putting, knocking something down and putting two up, and it was easy, then the price of the first thing would go up until there was no excess profit anymore. Um, and you would just be making the the market return. So anyway, sorry to digress. Uh, it, it's um, a, a, a lot of people would say that, um, and you use the word volatile, um, a lot of amateur investors might say that the markets are unpredictable. We say that there's a formula to understand that. Um, but I guess knowing what you know now, uh, what advice do you have um, maybe for people starting out to be able to navigate periods of significant market volatility? All right. And when you say navigate, um, do you mean they own property? And like, how do you think about, about from a mindset how, perspective? How do, you, how do you buy right? How do you deal with it? How do you block out the white noise? Yeah. Um, look, over time... Uh, through experience, through better models, through better access to information, um, we've become better at identifying. Like, and there's a feeling I have now where it's like there's periods of time where you go, I am absolutely certain of what's going to happen. Um, yeah. I would say the COVID lockdowns being one of those periods where, you know, we wrote a book saying this is what's going to happen. Like, we're that certain we published it because we said, let's. Well, you know, make sure that there's a record of this because um, I don't, you know, it's easy to say in hindsight that you said something was going to happen, but like, unless there's proof, like you know, anybody could do it. So, think um, about investing in the new normal, may as well give it a plug. I mean, it's got some of the, the process we went through yeah. to understanding what was going to happen. Uh, and while the time might have changed, there's always those rules that we followed kind of are consistent. So, for somebody starting out, I think there's false confidence that you can have um, where uh, you're not necessarily that well informed, but you hear something and you have that you don't know enough to know to doubt what you're hearing. 
Um, and that's positive and negative. Like you can hear negative things. People are absolutely certain the market was going to crash a year and a half ago. Um, and like some markets, prices didn't didn't go down. Certainly in the different parts of each market, prices kept going up in the lower quartile, for instance, because of that affordability constraint um, and the lack of housing and the undersupply that was getting worse and worse as time went on. Um, so... I, I think, again, if I try to break that down, it's um, doubt what you hear from uninformed sources and verify what you hear from informed sources. Look for the, like, you know, you need you need proof. Um, and while I can say that we do have a feeling of certainty um, at, at different times about different markets, um, you actually, I think, will very rarely, I believe, hear from me or anybody in our team saying, well, we guarantee this will be what the market does because there's always that component of, of risk. And if there wasn't a component, even if it's a small one, um, then the returns would be far, far less. So our goal is to minimize that risk. Uh, and when I talk about that small degree of risk, I say part of it is I don't know what's going to happen at some other far flung part of the world next year. Um, so I can't say with guaranteed certainty that something might not happen that does affect the outcome. But I can say with a very high degree of confidence that unless something crazy happens at some far-flung part of the world or perhaps even a little bit lower, closer, that I'm pretty confident of what the outcome is going to be in this area uh, and this type of property. Um, and again, that can only come with experience, with depth of knowledge, with resources um, at your disposal. So I think if, again, when we started, there was small amounts of information and, and people who were sharing um, that information, but largely it required for us a leap of faith. And I think there's a lot less leap, leap of faith now. Um, the biggest leap is to overcome the voices that you're hearing from well-meaning friends and colleagues uh, telling you their two cents um, to uh to influence you um rather than going to the um going to the experts who have got the knowledge and the resources and systems to be able to provide you with guidance and i really wish that i didn't have to you know i'm glad that i've got it now to share with others but i wish that i didn't have to go through the thousands and thousands of hours of learning and growth all on my own time and on my own dime um to get to a point where i could have that confidence without investing Awesome. Uh, really quick, like to finish. So, what do you think your life would look like today uh, if you had an investment property? Oh, wow. Um, I would be a much sadder person. Uh, a lot less choice. Um, you know, I live in a different state and can travel for work whenever I want. I get to go overseas. I get to help people. Um, and I, I think I would certainly be feeling a lot more constrained in my life. How about yourself? Uh, I'd probably be stressing uh, a lot about private school fees, maybe not even have the choice around where the kids went to school. Uh, couldn't see myself living in our dream home like we are now. Uh, and being able to help those around us uh, is a really satisfying feeling um, that uh, kind of every day gives me a reminder on the positive things that uh, we've taught you to be on. Continue to do today with that client. So um, great to, great episode today, Matt, on, uh, on you know, winding back the clock and what 25 is. 25 years of insight has, uh, has taught us today. Thanks for joining us as always. Thanks, boss.